Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. I'm John. And today we have a controversial case. One that you're gonna have to really think about and decide which story you believe. And I'll tell you right off the bat, I don't even know where I stand yet. Today, we're discussing the murder of Jacqueline DeWallaby. In September of 1988, Jacqueline DeWallaby was seven years old, cute as a button with her dark brown hair and her crooked bangs. The picture of her that circulated all over really reminded me of myself. Maybe that's why I felt so deeply about this case when I first started researching it. She reminded me of me. She lived in Midlothian, Illinois with her mother, Cynthia, her stepdad, David, and her four-year-old brother, Davey. Her biological father, Jimmy Guess, wasn't in the picture. He and Cynthia had gone through a rough divorce, and he had previously stated that he, quote, didn't want anything to do with her, end quote. They'd gone on to separate a short time before Jacqueline was born. Lastly, we can't forget Anna, David's mother, who actually owned the home and lived in the basement apartment of the house, which you had to access through the main entrance. So I'm sure you can tell it's one big party at the Dwallaby household. Lots of people coming in and out of the home at all times. Now, according to court documents and information gathered, we believe the following timeline of events to be true, based on the family's account told to police. Friday, September 9th, 1988, was like any other day. David worked until early evening and arrived home around 5.30 p.m. David had plans for a little later to go out with some friends at a local bowling alley. He left around 6 p.m. and arrived back home between 9 and 9.30 p.m. When he walked through the door, he saw his sister Michelle had come over, most likely for dinner, and was hanging with Cynthia, Anna, and the kids. She would leave a short time after David returned home. Once she left, the whole crew hung out for a bit, having a relaxing evening. They chilled on the couch, watched TV, nothing out of the ordinary. Now that's my kind of night. Jacqueline and David grew tired before the rest and went up to bed at around 10.30 p.m. They couldn't hang like Cynthia and Davy. They went up to their respective rooms and were joined by the others about an hour later. This was around the time Anna's night would begin. Oh, Anna. She wasn't like the others. She was more of a party animal. Almost midnight and this woman is leaving the house. Dang, girl. I can't even hang at 28. Good for you. She left around the same time Jacqueline and David had gone up to bed, 10.30 p.m. Supposedly, she was heading to a restaurant known as Papacino's. She leaves her basement apartment, heads out the back door, and locks it behind her. She wouldn't return home until the next day. Around 7.30 a.m., the Dwallaby's alarm blared. Son of a, it was the weekend. Someone must have forgotten to shut it off. David and Cynthia shut the alarm off and fall back asleep, but David is woken back up a short time later by Davy, who either heard the alarm or had that little kid internal clock snap him awake. David and his son got up quietly and left the room as to not disturb anyone else. He set Davy up on the couch to watch Saturday morning cartoons as he went along with his morning routine. Mm, cartoons hit different back then, am I right? Now everything's streaming, no fun commercials, shit's whack. <laughs> yeah, they sure did. I mean, I was a 90s baby, so I feel like they were like bigger and more popular for kids born in the 80s, like you. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I was old enough to really watch them, we were kind of headed into the 2000s. Hey, even the 2000s had some bangers. True, true. I guess maybe I just don't remember them as fondly as you. <laughs> As David made his way through the house, he discovered something strange. The front door was open. That's odd. He was sure he'd closed it and locked it last night. He went over, shut the door, relocked it, and joined Davy on the couch. How is that not a red flag to check your entire house right now? I get that his mom lives with them, so maybe she had left it open at some point. But come on, you see it open, you gotta check, make sure everybody's okay. 100%. I totally agree. Like, Literally the other day, I was like freaking out over someone walking into our backyard and come to find out it was literally our landscaper. But I mean, I don't know. I'm worried about every little thing. So why wouldn't David at least have like some sense of worry, be like, oh, I need to double check the house. Not even just to confirm that the kids are all there, but 
to make sure that there isn't some intruder lying in wait for you. Mm -hmm. I agree. Cynthia would wake up a little while later and come downstairs to greet her husband and son. She asked if Jacqueline was up yet. David answered no, she wasn't. So Cynthia headed back upstairs to go get her. She'd slept in late enough on this Saturday morning. As Cynthia walked into Jacqueline's bedroom, her heart sank. Her daughter wasn't in her bed. That didn't make sense. If David said she wasn't up yet, where could she be? Maybe he just hadn't seen her? Cynthia ran downstairs and told David that Jacqueline wasn't in her room. The two began frantically searching the house. And then David remembers. The front door was open. Could she have left the house? Was she in the backyard? Had she wandered off to a neighbor's? They run outside and check everywhere. They still couldn't find her. They hopped in their car and circled the neighborhood several times. Still no Jacqueline. When they arrived home after checking the neighborhood, they noticed something strange. A glimmer caught their eye. What was that? Glass? Near a basement window? They ran to go look at the window. It had been smashed. Oh God, had someone come in the house the night before and snatched Jacqueline as she slept? At this point, they knew they had to call police. Based on transcripts, the call to police to report their daughter missing was made at 1026 a.m. So right off the bat, I find it hard to believe that someone broke into a basement window, made their way all the way through the house, found Jacqueline sleeping in bed, abducted her, and made it out the front door without anybody noticing. Absolutely. Basement windows are tiny, especially if you live in like an older house. And I mean, I guess I could see if they had a walkout basement, but we know they don't. We already said that Anna had to get to the basement from the main entrance. So there's no way an adult person is fitting through that window. Yeah, I'm on the same page as you with that. Once police received the alert that there was a missing seven-year-old girl, they sprung into action and headed to the Dwallaby's home immediately. They did a quick sweep of the house when they got there just to double check and confirm she wasn't still inside. As they're searching, something struck one of the officers as peculiar. Jacqueline's room was a mess. Not completely destroyed, but oddly messy for a seven-year-old. Things were strewn all about. The parents mentioned to the cop that the only thing they saw missing from the room was Jacqueline's bedspread. The officer noticed there was even a half-packed up suitcase on the bed with clothes laying in and around it. Weird. Was Jacqueline trying to pack up and leave? When the officer questioned Cynthia about it, she replied saying it was one of her, quote, playthings. I assume she means her seven-year-old daughter had an active imagination and pretended she was going on vacation or something. I mean, I guess I can see that. Our friends, young kids, have very active imaginations and also make up games with very basic household items. So, yeah, I guess I understand what she means by this. So, I vaguely remember as a kid that I had a brief fascination with being a hobo. <laughs> like the ones that carried the stick over their shoulder and had their stuff wrapped up and tied to the end of it. I don't know where it came from, but maybe it's along the same lines. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is hilarious. But why a hobo? That is such an odd fascination. I think it had to do with my mom being a hobo for Halloween one year, and it must have just stuck. Okay, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> As the officer continued his investigation, he decided not to delve into the room any further, though still believed it to be something of interest. When David and Cynthia went on to explain what had happened, David made sure to mention that there was a lock on the top of the front door, like a chain lock, up high enough that the two young kids couldn't reach. This is important going forward, keep it in mind. At this point, there are additional police officers arriving in the area to continue the search for Jacqueline. Her parents would alert police to that broken basement window they'd found earlier and expressed how they thought it may have been a point of entry for the person responsible for their daughter's disappearance. Investigators take note of this information and believe at this point that Jacqueline may have been taken in the night by a stranger who'd broken into the home. I know I'm repeating myself, but I don't buy it. Well, I was gonna bring this up later, but because of your stance on it so early on in our story, let's just get it out of the way now. You're not the only one not buying it. When authorities first take a look at that broken window, they're confused. It was broken, yes, but the glass laid outside the house. If someone had broken in, wouldn't it be on the inside? Yeah, that doesn't make sense at all. Maybe some of the glass would have fallen down outside, but I think there would most likely be more inside. Yeah, and besides the suspicious glass... There was also a layer of dust still on the windowsill, 
like it hadn't been touched for some time. I mean, how would that not have been disturbed if someone was climbing through the window? Yeah, none of this broken window nonsense adds up to me. Even the most average-sized person would struggle to get into one of those. Like you said, they're pretty tiny. And think, if you have to take the time to break it, clean out all of the glass before crawling through so you don't cut yourself, that's a fair amount of noise and time. Time where someone could wake up from inside or time for a neighbor to see you. If this is actually what happened, I'd be shocked. Yeah, I'm with you. And Anna, the grandmother, she even went on to later state that nothing below the window was disturbed. Try and explain that one. As we move on in our story, there seems to be some contradicting information on this next statement. But it seems that David mentioned that he remembered leaving the back door unlocked and insinuates that maybe whoever took Jacqueline had gotten in that way. Oh, please. This guy seems guiltier and guiltier by the minute. Right? I have several questions about this. How could you have been so positive before that you'd closed and locked your front door, but then you remember later that you left the back door open? Because he's making shit up. Also, he was supposedly already in bed at 10.30 p.m., and Anna had left the house right at that time, through the back door, and she was certain she'd closed and locked it behind her. So, David, are you saying that you went up to bed, Anna left... Then you came back down and unlocked the door? No, things are starting to get a little fishy here. There's clearly some contradicting stories and evidence at this point, and I'm having a hard time following David's sequence of events. Even though the family is starting to seem a little sketchy in the initial stages of the investigation, police don't probe much further because they've been so cooperative. They provide urine, weird, but okay, and blood samples, as well as all the family's medical records just in case they were needed in the investigation. I think all families would be cooperative in an investigation like this, but you also need to be cognizant of when people are being overly cooperative, like in a suspicious way. It's hard to explain. It's like something you have to sense. Right. I I know what you mean. It's, I guess it's kind of like when Brian Laundrie was being questioned by police when he was pulled over in that domestic dispute before Gabby was murdered. You knew right off the bat that he was suspicious because he just would not stop talking. The whole time I was watching that footage, I just wanted him to shut the hell up. Yeah, that's the type of thing I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Days would go by agonizingly slow as they waited and hoped that Jacqueline would come home. Police had access to the Dwallaby's home during this time and continued to search for any evidence that could lead them to Jacqueline's whereabouts. However, our story takes a heartbreaking turn when on September 14th, 1988, just five days after Jacqueline was last seen, a man living at the Islander Apartments in Blue Island, Illinois, which was only three miles from the Dwallaby's home, would stumble upon Jacqueline's body. How horrible this poor seven-year-old girl killed and left lying on the ground alone, and the man who found her likely scarred for life by the sight of it. Jacqueline had been deceased for several days by this point, her body decomposing quickly, covered with bugs and other creatures. Police arrive on scene and secure the area to begin their investigation. Jacqueline's body was laying on the ground in some brush, partially wrapped in a multicolored blanket with a rope wrapped tightly around her neck, twice. A pair of white underwear, thought to belong to Jacqueline, were laying pretty much right next to her body. Police would gather the evidence around her remains and take her body in for an autopsy. I find it strange that a killer would leave the murder weapon on scene after they dump the body. It makes me think that the disposing of the body could have been done like hastily or under stress. Yeah, for sure. I I thought the same thing. You would think that there would be all kinds of evidence left behind on it, but then again, this is 1988, so who knows what they might have even collected from it. When the police alert her parents of their discovery, they're notably distressed by the news. Likely the type of reaction you would expect when someone's child has just been found dead. And not only dead, but brutally strangled. As the family tried to cope with this empty hole in their lives now that they know Jacqueline's fate police begin to work the case even harder to try and find out who'd done this to sweet Jacqueline. The autopsy tech would continue their examination of her body and the items found alongside her. They were able to determine a few things about the underwear they found where she was located. They confirmed that there were no bodily fluids in the underwear, no semen or blood, but they did, however, find two hairs, one pubic hair and one head hair. Jacqueline was only seven years old, so the pubic hair absolutely did not belong to her. 
Once the autopsy was completed, the ME couldn't say if Jacqueline had been sexually assaulted or not. There was no definitive evidence to confirm that. The medical examiner could determine, though, that she had in fact died from ligature strangulation by the rope that was wrapped around her neck. There were no other visible marks on her body that would have attributed to her death. He also determined she'd been dead for approximately five and a half days, which meant she had most likely died the night she disappeared. The Emmy goes on to mention that they were unsure if her body had been in that spot the entire time, or if she may have been killed somewhere else and placed there later. How can you not tell if a seven-year-old has been sexually assaulted? This would be good information for investigators to have going forward in order to help narrow down a suspect. I don't know. I guess I feel like that would be something that could be determined since her remains are intact and not skeletal, but who knows? Now, at this point, police have some serious work to do. They have a young girl who was believed to have been taken from her home in the middle of the night, murdered for seemingly no reason at all, and discarded only a few miles from her home. They not only had an obligation to find Jacqueline's killer, but also to keep the public, who I'm sure was extremely worried, safe from any further abductions. Several months would go by before anything substantial happened in the case. The next thing we know, it's November 1988, and Cynthia and David DeWallaby were under arrest for their daughter's murder. I'm sure you're thinking, what? What do you mean they arrested the parents? They gave this detailed account of what happened the night before they found out she had disappeared, how they discovered she was missing the following morning, and they reacted exactly as you'd expect grieving parents to react when their daughter's body was discovered. Yeah, I can't say that I'm surprised. They they were sus from the get-go. Well, little did we know that for the past couple months, police had been working on a theory. A theory that the parents were involved in the murder of their daughter. We don't know for sure what happened, and maybe we'll never know. But we can certainly speculate. I want to give you a rundown of the evidence that police bring to light against the Dewallabies. Let's start with the first thing that stood out to me, and what I mentioned to you earlier to keep in your head. The fact that the front door was open when David woke up the morning of September 10th. If it were me, alarm bells would be going off immediately. Why was the door open? Who could have opened it? Especially with the fact that David had mentioned previously that there was a latch at the top of the door that kept the kids from being able to open it. It stated that David believed his mother Anna may have left out that door, but honestly, who leaves it wide open? And if it were left open, I would certainly still be checking on every single person in my household to make sure they're all safe. So David's account was already contradicted by his mother. She said she left out the back door and that she had locked it. The front door with the chain lock, which David said he was sure he had locked, would have had to have been opened from the inside or else it would have been visible damage to the door from being forced open. And you're damn right, when you notice that thing open, you check the whole house. Yep, and as we move on, let's stay on the topic of how the person would have potentially gotten in the house, or, depending on which story you believe, how the Dewallabies staged it as such. We know that the back door was closed and locked, as Anna stated. However, after discovering the broken basement windows, David mentions that he believes he may have left that back door unlocked. The sequence of events of when Anna left the house and when David went up to bed aren't 100% clear, but it's believed that Anna was likely out of the house and locking that back door after David had already gone to bed. He would have had to come down after going to bed, use that door, and failed to lock it when coming back in. That's certainly something he'd have remembered doing. So... Based on all the evidence and the stories we've been told up to this point, the doors were most likely closed and locked when the family went to bed. Which makes me think that something happened to Jacqueline at the hands of someone inside that house. Yeah, unless you believe that someone could have gotten in through that broken window, right? Well, there are two differing stories when it comes to that. Let's start with what the scene looked like. The window was smashed and a pile of glass had been placed in the grass outside the home. The first story, some may believe, is that the window was broken from the inside and the glass had fallen outward. The second is what is believed to be true, is that someone had broken the window from the outside, but picked each shard from the frame before crawling inside. Okay, so if that's correct, then how could they have gotten in without disturbing the dust on the windowsill or any of Anna's items that were sitting on the table below the window? It all just seems so strange to me. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's strange and borderline not possible. Exactly. And I mean, we're not the only ones that think this way, and we'll come back to that later. The next piece of evidence police use against the parents 
are the blood stains that were found on Jacqueline's pillow. And when were these found? The parents didn't point them out to police when they saw them? Nope, which is why I left it out earlier when talking about their statement. They never even mention it. Well, that makes you raise your eyebrow then. Who lets their kids sleep on a pillow stained with blood? My thoughts exactly. These stains were also different in, quote, color and intensity, indicating that one was older than the other. So what could this mean? Was Jacqueline the victim of an accidental death and her parents panicked, wrapped her in a comforter and drove her to Blue Island where they dumped her body? I mean, I thought David was suspicious from the beginning. He and Jacqueline went up to bed around the same time. Could something have happened between then and when Cynthia and Davy went up to bed? Well, in the court documents, it actually does say that Cynthia shut off Jacqueline's overhead light and she checked the kids before going to bed, so I'm not sure. Do we at least know if the blood that was on the pillow was Jacqueline's? Forensics weren't able to concretely say it was hers, but the blood type did match. Like we talked about before, this is a time where police really didn't go the distance with DNA evidence, so getting the blood type was pretty much the best you were going to get. But, I mean, we can probably assume it was hers. It's on her pillow from two different time periods. I don't know, maybe one night she had a nosebleed or she lost a tooth and it bled on the pillow a little bit. Or it could be something more nefarious. Oh, it, it certainly could be, but... At this point, there's nothing proving one way or the other. But it does make you wonder, what was going on in that room the night of her disappearance? Back to what I was saying earlier, and this is just speculation. What about the possibility of her parents accidentally killing her? One of Jacqueline's hairs would later be discovered in the trunk of the Dewalabi's car. Why would her hair be back there? She's a little girl. What business would she have being in and around the trunk? I know it's the family's car and hair falls out all over the place, but... Why in there? I don't know, just something that caught my interest. Yeah, I could go both ways on that. I mean, maybe her hair was on something that was put in the trunk, and then later it was taken out and the hair fell off in there. Or maybe you're onto something, and her body was placed back there after she was murdered. But I'd need a little more convincing before making a determination. Well, there's more evidence that comes out later, but I don't want to put the cart before the horse in our story just yet. So the Dwalabies were arrested in November of 1988 and would wait about a year and a half before going to trial in April of 1990. During their trial, an eyewitness comes forward with some very interesting information, saying that he saw David Dwalaby at the Islander Apartments where Jacqueline's body was found the same night she went missing. Everett Mann provides testimony that he arrived home to the Islander Apartments around 2 a.m. Saturday, September 10th. By this time, his normal parking spot was taken, probably because it was so late, so he drives around looking for another one. Driving through the lot, he sees an occupied vehicle over near the area where Jacqueline would later be located. At the time, he didn't think anything of it, probably just another person looking for a place to park, until he later hears about the discovery of a young girl's body. Everett goes on to describe the car he saw as dark-colored, but had picked out the late 1970s light blue Chevy Malibu owned by Cynthia from a photo lineup. He stated that the light blue car could have appeared dark that night due to the poor lighting in the lot. He goes on to say that when the headlights of the vehicle turned on, he saw someone's side profile while sitting in the driver's seat, explaining that he could tell the person was a male and had a very large nose but couldn't make out their race. So I wonder how long he watched this car for. He sees the person inside the car when the lights turn on, but did he ever witness the driver outside the vehicle? Or anyone else for that matter? Could the person in the driver's seat have stayed in there the whole time, while someone else may have been hiding Jacqueline's body? Yeah, that's a good question, and honestly the court documents don't even really make mention of it. They do say, though, that Everett had seen the person in the car from, like, 75 yards away, and as he described, poor lighting. I wouldn't describe David's nose to be very large, but in this lighting, maybe it could seem that way. Well, 75 yards is a pretty long distance, too. I mean, you're talking more than two telephone poles away. It's definitely going to be hard to get an accurate description of someone from that length. Right? The distance and dim to no lighting, it makes it hard to believe that Everett's providing solid info. He would later be shown a photo lineup, too, in an attempt to pick out the suspect, and he goes on to choose David DeWallaby. But the problem is, the photo of David 
was 30% larger than all the others in the lineup. That's a huge issue. I mean, in a lineup, all the photos need to be exactly the same, like the same pose and everything. The only thing that's supposed to be different is the person in the picture. I know. So I'm really iffy on this guy. Everett Mann just doesn't seem like a reliable witness to me. He very well may have seen something, but the inconsistencies just throw me off. He called the car dark colored, then picks out a light colored car from the lineup. Then he says he saw a guy's side profile and they had a very large nose, but he picks out a front facing picture of David, whose nose isn't that large. And all the while, the information he's providing is gathered while he's like 200 plus feet away in a nearly pitch black parking lot. Like, come on. I'm there with you. I mean, as much as we'd love to believe any information that someone comes forward with that's in favor of our own beliefs, we can't just blindly believe it. Yep, but you bet your bottom dollar the prosecution uses him and brings him to trial to tell his story to implicate the Dewalabies. And yes, I said the Dewalabies, plural, because they were both brought to trial. This wasn't just a case against the stepfather David, but also Cynthia. But like I questioned earlier, man never saw another person, just the guy with the big nose. So I wonder how they're trying to get Cynthia wrapped up into all of this. Well, as the trial continues, there are others who come forward with information that would seem damning towards both defendants. A neighbor would go on to testify that they saw Davy DeWallaby, Jacqueline's brother, playing with a rope that looked incredibly similar to the one that was found around Jacqueline's neck. They would also state that the rope was long, kind of like an old clothesline, and that once Jacqueline had been found, he hadn't seen Davy playing with it anymore. Conflicting testimonies would also come out of a few neighbors going forward. Some would testify that they saw the Malibu in the Dwalabi's driveway at night and the following morning, in regards to the day of the disappearance. Others stated that the vehicle was not there at 2 a.m., so that makes you question what information and whose testimony is actually accurate. Well, assuming that all these people are going off their own knowledge and not formulating something in their mind based off of things that they've already heard, I'd be inclined to believe those that said the vehicle wasn't there at 2 a.m. when you have someone that can give you like a concrete time that coincides with other testimonies. It feels more accurate as opposed to somebody that says that the car was there at night and then in the morning. I tend to think that the people who said that saw it before bed and then once they woke up. But maybe the person that said it wasn't there at 2 a.m. either got home around that time or woke up for some reason and looked outside. Well, another neighbor testified that their dogs had been barking like wildly between 11 p.m. and 1.30 a.m., which that neighbor said it's completely unlike them. So that could go along with what you're saying, like where someone has that specific time in mind because something happened out of the ordinary which, like you said, coincides with other testimony, like Everett's, who saw a car at the Islander Apartments around 2 a.m. Right, and even if Everett's depiction of the operator and the vehicle might not be super accurate, the timeline could still be. I still don't know what I believe from Everett Mann, but when putting the timelines of these other witnesses next to his, at least you can, like, link those up. As the trial continues and we hear more testimony, tons of circumstantial evidence would come to light, but nothing concrete, until we hear some information from Davey. Now, he was four and a half at the time Jacqueline was killed, but had been interviewed by several child psychologists as well as police. He would go on to say some things that really make you question the Dewalabi's parenting style. Now, that's not to say they killed their daughter, but what Davey had to say was certainly interesting. He went on to state that his parents would spank both of them, but that Jacqueline got the brunt of it. He says, quote, Jacqueline was the one that got spanked so much, end quote. I mean, we know how brutally honest little kids are, so you'd think this is probably true. Except, we don't know how these interviews went down. I was unable to find any recordings, so it's not clear if Davy could have been led down a path to make these claims to appease investigators, or if he brought them up of his own volition. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, without recordings, I think you have to take this info with a little bit of suspicion. I mean, we're just talking about how police showed a photo lineup with the picture of their prime suspect enlarged 30%. I know. And like after seeing, for example, Making a Murderer and the way police interrogated Brendan Dassey and essentially forced him to say what they wanted, I'm very skeptical. Mm -hmm. 
Now, before we get into the verdict, let's talk about what the prosecution thinks occurred the night Jacqueline died. Prosecution alleges that based on information provided by Davey, that David and Cynthia were abusive towards Jacqueline. They go on to state that it's believed the parents had tied Jacqueline to her bed with the rope, and as she tried to wriggle herself out of it, she strangled herself. This goes back to what I said earlier. Did the parents panic after discovering her dead in the bedroom? So I actually find this plausible. I mean, the family could have been downstairs watching TV when, let's say, Jacqueline started acting up. David brings her upstairs, ties her to the bed, then proceeds to do whatever. Cynthia and Davy come upstairs after about an hour. Cynthia finds Jacqueline strangled by the rope as she tried to escape from it and freaks out. She rushes Davy away so he doesn't see anything. Then she goes and gets David. They craft some type of plan to cover up what happened. They break the basement window, dispose of their daughter's body, and then come up with the act that they tell police the next day. Ugh, I don't know. When I first saw that this was the route the prosecution was going, I was totally skeptical, and I think I still am. I just, I don't know how realistic this actually is. Like, how tight would the rope have had to be on her for her to wriggle around so much that it was tight enough on her neck to essentially strangle her to death? I don't think it's not plausible, but... It just feels so unrealistic and weird to me. But there was that tragic story from not too long ago where that high school kid died in the parking lot of the school. He'd been reaching over the back of a foldable seat in his vehicle, and then it folded back on him, trapping him upside down and ended up suffocating him. So like crazy unfortunate stuff like this does happen, and if one of the Dewalabies did tie Jacqueline to her bed, I can 100% picture a child jumping around, twisting, and accidentally getting whatever they're tethered with, stuck around their neck and strangling themselves. Okay, okay, I I can see where you're coming from. And side note, if this is true, what a messed up way to try and punish your child. I totally agree. So, I also mentioned to you earlier about that broken window and the undisturbed dust on the windowsill. Well, one of the experiments that took place at trial was for one of the thinner jurors to attempt to get through a window of the same size and not disturb anything. It comes out that he's unable to complete the task. However, apparently David DeWallaby had had a friend do the same thing, which he recorded, and it was determined that this friend was able to do it. It's strange. I mean, I guess it's possible if you know you're purposely not trying to disturb anything. But is a burglar really thinking about dust on a windowsill when breaking into a home to abduct a child? It's pretty doubtful. It seems so fishy to me. And I mean, it's a basement window. Do you know how small those things are? I just don't see how anyone could accomplish this without disturbing one thing, like one little thing, let alone the dust that's there. And how would they even know if there was anything under that window unless they're like casing the house or something? The burglar's not thinking about dust on a windowsill like, oh, let me make sure that I crawl over this and don't touch this to not move the inch of dust below this windowsill or whatever. So it just doesn't make sense to me. The only way I could see this happening is if someone was specifically casing the house, had been in the house, had seen it and said, yeah, this is where I'm going to come in through the house because it's going to be super unsuspicious or whatever because I'm not going to disturb anything. But you can't fucking guarantee that you're not going to disturb anything. It's just stupid. Right. With that, the prosecution rests and it's time for jury deliberations. However... Just before this happens, the judge would make a shocking decision that would alter the course of not only this verdict, but the Dwalabi's lives forever. The judge declares that there is insufficient evidence to convict Cynthia Dwalabi and drops the charges against her. But he lets the jury deliberate to potentially convict David. I have to believe that the one piece of evidence that the judge used to make this determination had to be the eyewitness testimony from Everett Mann. That seems to be the only information that weighs heavier towards a conviction for David. Yeah, I'd say it seems that way. So, the jury deliberates and comes back in just 14 hours with a verdict. David DeWallaby is guilty for the murder of his stepdaughter, Jacqueline. He's soon sentenced to 45 years in prison. But, as I mentioned in a previous episode, it ain't over till it's over. Which, depending on what you believe happened, is very upsetting. The following year, in October of 1991, David DeWallaby's conviction is overturned, and he's a free man. They determined that there was insufficient evidence for the jury to 
actually be able to convict him. The judge that exonerated David, Judge David Serta, states, quote, Opportunity alone is not sufficient to sustain a conviction unless the state can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that no one else had the opportunity to commit the crime. He continues, There clearly were others who had the opportunity. End quote. Others that had the opportunity? Like Cynthia, who they just let off? Or Anna? Or are there other people they think might have been involved? I was thinking the same thing. Like, what? There are other people who had the opportunity? Are you kidding? Well, there were two people who would come to light, one being the mentally ill brother of Jacqueline's biological father, Tim Guess, and the other, a child sex offender living in the area, Perry Hernandez. We'll start with Perry, mainly because I feel like there isn't enough evidence to really tie this to him, so I want to get this theory out of the way early on. Perry Hernandez was a child molester whose M.O. resembled that of what happened in Jacqueline's case. Just a year after Jacqueline would go missing, he would abduct and molest a six-year-old girl from the neighboring town of Blue Island, where Jacqueline's body was found. He had broken into the family's home during the night and took her out of the house to commit his wicked deed, and he did this without anyone being alerted to his presence. However, in this case, the young girl is not killed, and we also discover that Perry had left a ton of physical evidence at the scene. This doesn't really coincide with Jacqueline's case because there was no evidence that there was actually an intruder who'd made their way into the house. No fingerprints, no blood, no fluids that could tie anyone to her abduction. And we find out earlier that during Jacqueline's autopsy, it's determined that the medical examiner couldn't conclusively tell if she'd been sexually assaulted or not. Yes, her underwear were found right next to her body with a pubic hair that certainly didn't belong to Jacqueline, but that doesn't mean that the person who committed this act had actually succeeded in sexually assaulting her. And you're telling me, even though her body had been out there, deceased for five and a half days, that you wouldn't be able to determine if a prepubescent girl hadn't been sexually molested or raped? I feel like that would be very clear. Just my two cents. Perry Hernandez had a very specific M.O., He was looking to abduct these girls to sexually assault them. That was his end goal, not to murder them. So, do you really think he was the person to kill Jacqueline? I lean towards no, based on the info we had previously found out about the family, but also because of what we find out with this other person who could have allegedly been responsible. I had mentioned Jacqueline's biological father, Jimmy Guess, earlier. He'd been in prison at the time of Jacqueline's disappearance, so he was ruled out pretty quickly as not having been responsible. However, as police investigated him, they discovered that he had a mentally ill brother named Tim, a clinically diagnosed schizophrenic. As police investigated Tim, they discover he had actually been accused of trying to kidnap his niece before, but nothing further came out about this. When questioned in regards to this case, Tim has an alibi. Based on several statements, he'd been at a 24-hour restaurant all night, the night of Jacqueline's disappearance, so he was subsequently ruled out. However, Later on in the investigation, and after David was convicted, one of the waitresses that had vouched for Tim recanted her freaking statement and said he had only been there for a short time, around 9.30. And do you want to know why? Because she thought that the parents were guilty, so she covered for Tim so the parents would get what was coming to them. Um, what? Who do you think you are, lady? Lying for someone else because you think you know what's right? This aggravates me to no end. Poor Jacqueline's life was taken by some monster, and you didn't let the police investigate every single possibility because you thought you knew who did it? I can't even begin to imagine the gall people have in this world. Not only did the waitress recant her statement, but several of the regulars at this particular restaurant would come forward to also say that Timothy was not there on the night in question. Then another waitress comes forward and says she was never even questioned by police but stated that Tim used to sometimes drive her home after work to the frickin' Islander Apartments. (laughs) Wow. Talk about infuriating. Yup. And Timothy Guest died in 2002. What if he had something to do with this and could have been held accountable for his actions? And now, because of these false statements, that'll never happen. Now, back to David's release. Frustrating as it is, if you compile everything the defense put forward, it is fair to say that the judge's statement could be right. They went on to explain how Cynthia, David, and Anna could have all had the opportunity to kill Jacqueline. Anna's whereabouts were only accounted for as leaving the house around 10.30 p.m., 
and meeting up with a friend at the El Dorado restaurant sometime after midnight, staying with that friend through the morning. Where could she have been for that time in between? The defense also talks about the potential for an intruder and how the police only investigated entrance through the broken window, which was determined to not have happened. But there were other basement windows left unlocked, also with no screens that were not looked into. They also proclaimed that the most incriminating evidence against David was that provided from Everett Mann. Defense states that Mann was unable to tell if the person in the vehicle was, quote, white or black, young or old, had or did not have a mustache, was bald or had a full head of hair or wore glasses, or had any other identifying characteristics, end quote, and labeled his testimony as, quote, doubtful, vague, unreliable, and of no probative value, end quote. Well, when you lay everything out like that, it's certainly enough to generate some reasonable doubt. I know, and it's so upsetting because now we're left with no answers. And I had read a brief article in the Chicago Tribune regarding an interview with Cynthia Dewallaby and her feelings on when she was arrested and all that. It was upsetting to read her account of things, and she made it seem like she was truly heartbroken. But geez, you never really know. She could be coming up with all these things to say because... Maybe she knew it was an accidental death and she was horrified by what happened. Or maybe she didn't really know anything. There are just so many different possibilities. I don't even know where to go with them. Every time I bring up one piece of evidence on this case and how it makes me feel, I go back and forth on both sides and then can't definitively say whether I agree with it or not. My gut tells me that her parents, or maybe just David, had something to do with it. Maybe it was an accident and he asked Timothy Guess for assistance. I don't know. At first thought, that feels completely off base, but I also feel like there's a lot we just don't know. I get that Timothy Guess wasn't even related to David, but maybe they had a relationship that we were never made aware of. This guy had a severe mental illness that can mess with his head and his sense of reality. So maybe he did have something to do with it. And especially since we found out he had ties to the apartment complex where Jacqueline's body was found. Then my mind goes to what if David panicked after finding that Jacqueline had died by accident and he needed someone to help dispose of her body. Tim could have been perfect because of his mental illness. The police may not believe what he would have to say if he ever tried to rat on David. I mean, he was a diagnosed schizophrenic. He had said some pretty crazy things in the past. Tim is even quoted as having said a spirit living inside him told him details of the murder. Maybe this, quote, spirit was really David and he told him what happened in the house the night of the murder, but Tim spun this all around in his mind to make it seem like it wasn't real life he was living? I don't know. There are just so many possibilities and it's so unfair that Jacqueline may never get justice, especially if David was the killer. Because he was exonerated, he's never able to be tried again in this case due to double jeopardy. So... Even if information came out later about his involvement and it was concrete evidence, we still could never have him convicted for the same crime twice. It's freaking heartbreaking. Jacqueline deserved better and deserved for people to do right by her. This case frustrates me to no end, and it's so similar to that of JonBenet Ramsey. As I was researching, there were so many people on Reddit threads and forums talking about the similarities. But at least for JonBenet, no one has ever been charged, so... If information did come out at a later date that her family was responsible, at least justice could be served. That is just unfortunately not the case for Jacqueline DeWallaby. Even though there is no way David could be charged or convicted again for Jacqueline's murder, I still think it's important that people don't forget about this case. You never know. There may be someone out there that knows more than they were willing to say back in the 80s and 90s when this case was in the media. Maybe someone confessed to them and they have this information. So with that, if you know anything at all about Jacqueline DeWallaby's murder, please call the Midlothian Police Department at 708-385-2534. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode.